Bov Basu Dav Kuf Yud Tet Amud Bet, teaching seriousness. Tzlof Chad L'Shem Shemayim Nitkaven, teaching the law, teaching halacha is relatively simple. It's just a matter of imparting facts to people. But halacha is so much more than a system of law. It's also the expression of Yir Shemayim. It's the way we relate to Hashem. It's it's expressing our desire to fulfill God's will. How do you teach that? Uh, and that's part of the problem, the way halakha is often taught today, that it's taught as a list of do's and don'ts, it's taught as a, uh, as a system of law, but it's so much more than that, and we run the risk of losing that which is, which is more. And we uh, gain an approach to, to how to teach seriousness, because seriousness is an emotion. You, you want to teach not just the facts, you want to teach a way of relating to the law. And how you do that is something we'll see in our sugya, which deals with the Benot Tzlovchad, because the daughters of Tzlovchad claim a right of inheritance to their father's ter- property, even though he didn't leave a son. And from there, the, the Torah innovates the whole idea that the daughter takes the place of the sons and so on, and that fits in, of course, to our peric of, of Yesh Nochli. In the process, it leads us to the whole parsha in parsha Shlach the Chav, the Mekoshesh Etzim, the woodchopper. And there we have the situation of the Ayuban Israel Bamidbar, which is relevant. They were in the Midbar, they were in the desert. We'll see why that's relevant. And they found a man chopping wood on Shabbat. This is one of the early Shabbat thoughts, and they found a man chopping wood on Shabbat. They brought him to Moshe and Aaron, and they said, This man's been chopping wood on Shabbat. What's the, what's the law? And they put him in prison because it wasn't quite clear what, is, what to do with him which is also kind of strange. It says he broke the Shabbos. What's so, what's so difficult to know what to do with him? Hashem says to Moshe, he has to die. He dies by stoning. And they took him out of the camp and they stoned him to death as God had commanded. That's the piece of, of Chumash on the Mekoshesh Etzim, the woodchopper. On that, giving that constant is the targum, context is the Targum Yonason. The Targum Yonason teaches us that what the situation was that Bnei Yisrael Shai and Bamidbara, when they were in the desert, Gzeirat Shabta Ishtamod Alohon, Baram Knasa de Shabta Lo Ishtamod Alohon. They had been taught the laws of Shabbos, but not the consequence of breaking the laws. So here we come into the idea of seriousness when we get into consequence. Uh, you know the law, but, but how, how is this something you go to prison for? Is this a capital offense? Is there a fine for this? Is there just a warning? But what is the consequence for breaking the law? The consequence gives us an idea of the seriousness of the law. And they didn't know the consequence. Come Gavra with the Beit Yosef, Omar Bemeimra Azul Vatlish Kissin. So there was a man from the house of Yosef who decided, I will go and chop wood and they'll have to determine what the punishment is for breaking the Shabbat, and then the then the nation will know. And there are four questions that I, that I want to ask on, on the Pasha. Firstly, what did they think and what did Tzlovcha teach them? What did they think before? They knew the laws of Shabbat, and, and we know already that there's a, a capital offense for breaking Shabbat. So Al Gemara and Davkuf Yutet says, yes, but Moshe wasn't sure which of the four death sentences applies, which is also not, not all that clear. What did they think initially? What did Tzlovcha teach them? What was this Hiddush? What was the innovation that Tzlovcha taught? Why did he have to put himself out there and, and profane the Shabbat? in order that he should be the culprit, he should be the example for which the law would have to be clarified. Why did he just wait? If they didn't know the law, if they didn't know the consequence, sooner or later somebody would break the Shabbos. So wait until somebody breaks the Shabbos and then they'll have to determine the law. Why are you going to put yourself out to be the first one? Slavkad is a, a frum man. Slavkad is a, a rov, a rosh Shiva. He goes out on Shabbos with his long black coat and his strimal and he starts chopping wood. Why does he do that? Why don't you wait till some person who, who's, uh, who breaks the Shabbos, why put yourself out? Say, and thirdly, why didn't Moshe just check in with Hashem? He talks to Hashem every day. Say, Moshe, you told us about Shabbos, but you didn't tell us what the punishment is. Can you let me know what the punishment is? And then he teaches B'nai Yisrael and like the rest of the Torah. Why this whole drama to teach us the consequence? And then there's the question of the Masha, which is who gave Tzlovchad the right to break Shabbos to teach people a lesson? How can you even make that calculation to, to break Shabbos to teach a people a lesson? So a lot of that is explained by a deeper understanding of the Tosfus on our daf, where the Tosfus brings, as an aside, because we're dealing with the daughters of Tzlovchad, and he brings the Medrash, that, that L'Shem Shamayim Nitzkaven, that this man who chopped the trees was Tzlovchad, the father of these five girls, and he did it L'Shem Shamayim. 
שהיו אומרים ישראל, כיוון שנגזר עליהם שלא להיכנס לארץ ממעשי מרגלים, שוב אין מחויבים במצוות. Now we begin to understand what the Jewish people thought. The Jewish people, after they were told that you're not going to go into Eretz Israel, you're going to die in the desert because of what happened with the, with the spies, with the Meraglim, they knew the Sifri in Parshas Ekev and the Ramban. The Sifri in Parshas Ekev says, on Vavadatim Meira, Vesamtim Etvara Ele, you will be lost from the land. If you don't keep the Torah, the, you'll, you'll be expelled from the land. Ushmartim Etvara Ele, and you shall keep these words. Afal Pishani Megaleet Chimina Aris Lechutzlats, He you Mitsuyanim Be Mitzvot. Even though there will come a time where you will be expelled from Israel and you will be in the Galut, you will be in exile, you still have to keep the Mitzvot. So that when you come back to Eretz Israel, they won't be strange for you. You'll be accustomed to the mitzvot. They'll be part of your way of life. You won't have to start again. So while you're in the period of the Galut, we were in the Galut for a thousand years. Uh, what would have happened if we not kept the Torah for those thousand years? So we kept the Torah going. We come back to Eretz Israel. We know what to do. It's kind of part of our lifestyle. And the, the Sifri then gives an, gives an example. Based on that, the Ramban says... The, the real mitzvah is when you're living in Eretz Israel. The mitzvot that you do outside of Eretz Israel are ki'ilu mitzvot. They're not, it's not the same level of mitzvahs when you're in Eretz Israel. And therefore the Sifri says, and he brings the Sifri, Yeshivat Eretz Israel shkula keneged kol mitzvot sheba Torah. That's why living in Israel is like all the mitzvot of the Torah, because it's only when you're living in Israel that you are actually fulfilling the mitzvot of the Torah. When you're outside of Israel, you're filling them for educational purposes. You're filling, fulfilling them in order to remain accustomed so that when you come back to Eretz Yisrael, you will have them. But the primary mitzvah is Eretz Yisrael. Outside of Eretz Yisrael, when you keep the, the mitzvahs outside of Israel, you're doing so as a, as a, it's a secondary mitzvah. It's, you're doing so in order that when you come back to Israel, you will be able to, you'll, you'll know what to do. So now we understand what they thought. So Tosfus expands using the medrash that he, that he finds. He expands on the Targum Yonason. Why did they not know the punishment? It's not that they didn't know that for Chilu Shabbos there's a punishment of death, that for profaning the Shabbos it's a capital offense. That they knew. But they in Bamidbar. That's why the, the Posuk starts by Yubene Israel Bamidbar. They were going to be in the Midbar forever. They were never going to have the problem of coming back to Israel, and now they're not used to the mitzvahs. They're never going to go to Israel. So once Hashem had removed from them the possibility of ever coming to Israel, they figured, so then the laws are the, are the Rabbonans, these are the, the rabbis require us to keep these laws, and fine, we'll keep them, but that's not as serious. Which explains why he didn't just wait for somebody to be over. Why didn't Slavka just wait for somebody to transgress? That would happen sooner or later. No, chas to Shalom. Nobody would transgress. Moshe Rabbeinu had taught. The Rabbana taught, even though the real mitzvah is in Eretz Israel, while you're in the midbar, you still can't, you've still got to keep Shabbos. He wasn't worried about somebody transgressing. He was worried about their mindset. How are they thinking about Shabbos? Do they realize that even though they're in the midbar, even though they're outside of Israel, it's as serious as if they're in Israel. It's for a different reason that it's serious. In Israel, it's the Iker HaMitzvah. And in Chutzot, it's, it's in order to retain the mitzvah. And we'll see in a moment exactly what that means. So it's, you're keeping the mitzvot for a different, a different cause. There's a different force of initiation. But the mitzvah is the same mitzvah. That's what they didn't get. And, and Slothchad wants to teach them the seriousness of, of the mitzvah. Why is it that, what, what does this really mean? What does he really teach them? What does Slothchad teach them? The Maharal explains the Ramban. It's actually really beautiful because we start with the Sifri, and then we have the Ramban. And if you look at the Maharal, you begin to understand the, the Ramban. This Ramban is so often misquoted by people who want to suggest that keeping the mitzvot outside of Eretz Yisrael is only the Rabban, and it's not so serious, it's not, the, it's not so at all. That's not what the Sifri means, and that's not what the Ramban means. And the Guraya is very clear on that. Ulufikach, he says, Kol mitzvot shehem chovat haguf chayavin There is no question that any mitzvah that is imposed on the individual, on the subject, on the person, has to be kept inside Israel and outside Israel. Trumas and maestros and things like that, which are laws that apply to the land, don't apply midoraisa outside of Eretz Israel. But putting on tefillin and mezuzahs and, and keeping kosher and Shabbos, all of the other laws, they apply exactly the same. 
explains the Guraya. As the Ramban himself says, Umasha Amar Kadeshuloyu Khadashim Alechem. So what does the Sifri mean when it when it says the reason you keep the mitzvahs in Chutzot is so that they won't be strange to you when you come to Israel? Surely that's not the reason. Explains the Maharal. That's explaining to you why you have to put on tefillin in the Chutzlaat and why you have to keep Shabbos in the Chutzlaat. And you chayev, the same consequence, the same punishments apply in Chutzlaat as in Israel. Explains the Maharal that what gives the mitzvot their power is the giving of them on Sinai. So when we, three, over 3,000 years later, keep a mitzvah, what makes that mitzvah important is that Hashem gave them to us on Sinai. But what connects us today, in Tafshin Pei He, what connects us today to what happened at Sinai over 3,000 years ago? What connects us is that there hasn't been a day in those 3,000 years where this mitzvah hasn't been kept. From the moment Hashem gave it on Sinai until today, Every one of those mitzvahs has been kept by some Jew somewhere in the world. There hasn't been a day in history where there's been a break in that continuity of the mitzvot. And therefore, when we keep the mitzvah, why are we keeping the mitzvah? Because our father kept the mitzvah. Why did our father? Because our grandfather. And so it goes back all the way to Har Sinai. But if there were to have been a generation when the mitzvah wasn't kept, then you would have to start a new, explains the Maral, with a new Natinah. God would have to come on Sinai again and re-give the Torah for Israel when you come back to Israel. That's not going to happen. There's only one Sinai. Sinai only happened once. So for that reason, we have to be sure to keep that string of continuity, that line of continuity, and keep the mitzvot no matter where we are, no matter what conditions we're under. The mitzvot have to be kept so that link isn't broken between the giving of the Torah on Sinai and the fulfillment of the Torah in our modern age. What links it all is the daily observance of those mitzvot. That's what the Ramban means and that's what the Sifri means. The mitzvah is as serious as it is in Israel, but for a different reason. In Israel it's the Kara mitzvah and in Kutzlar it's to keep the link between Har Sinai, between the giving of the Torah on Sinai and the fulfillment of the mitzvah in, in modern times. And that's what Slochad teaches them. You thought that because it's for a different reason that it's not as serious. I want you to see that it is serious. So why doesn't Moshe just teach them? Why doesn't he just give a shir? And he teach the Rabbonim and the Rosh Hashivas and the Dayonim. This is a Dor I said, this is a law of the Torah and the consequence of breaking the law will be a capital punishment. Why doesn't he just teach it? Why does Slochad have to go and give his life for it? So we need to understand, you can teach the law from a textbook, and you can teach halacha in a shir, but Yirash Shamayim has to be taught experientially, to, te to teach the connection to the Torah, to teach the connection to halacha. Why are we keeping this halacha? Why is this halacha important? That has to be taught experientially. Slavchad realizes, unless they see somebody being put to death for breaking Shabbos outside of Israel, their mindset will always be, it's, ah, it's not, that's not that important. You've heard people say, it's just a Dirabon. It's, it's, not a, it's, just a, it's just a Dirabon. What's just a Dirabon? It's no difference from our perspective. The, the differences are technical in, in the way we keep the Torah. There's no difference if it's a law of the rabbis or it's a law of the Torah. It has the same authority. Uh, where it comes from and our relationship to it is the same. And Slovchad wanted to be sure that it would be embedded into the consciousness and the subconsciousness of the Jewish nation how serious Chilul Shabbos is, breaking the Shabbat, whether you're in Israel or whether you're in Kutzlat. And the only way to do that would be to actually be seen breaking the Shabbat and, and to understand the, the consequences of that. So then the Ma'asho asks, who gives him, who gives him the right? What, what right does he have to make that, cal that calculation, to break the Shabbat in order to, 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 to make a lesson, to do a lesson? We find this even in secular legal systems. A judge will sometimes take a high-profile person and give him a punishment that is out of proportion to other people's punishment for that particular crime. And he'll say he's making an example. What does it mean he's making an example? He wants people to understand the seriousness. And if it's a high-profile case, people will see the seriousness from the consequence. But who gives Slavchad the right to do that? So the Maharal, so, so the Maharal explains, it's a, a, a controversial Maharal, that since Slovchad didn't do, didn't go chopping the trees because he wanted to make a fire, 
he went chopping the trees to teach a lesson. That means it's a melacha she'en etzichah legufa. It's a melacha where you don't need the outcome of the melacha. It's not a melacha machshevet, as the Gemara says. It's not a melacha created for that desired outcome. The outcome is a side outcome. The famous example the Gemara gives, and many examples, one of them is you, you drag a piece of furniture over a, wooden, over a sand floor. In the process, you're making a furrow in the floor, and you're not allowed to make a flat furrow in the ground. That's like plowing. Uh, but that's, you didn't do it because you wanted a furrow. You would rather there was no furrow. You just wanted to move the furniture. That's a melacha she'en atzicha legufa. You don't need the furrow. So that's, the, the, according to, to Rabbi Shimon, that's part of you, you, you're not chayim. So here too, Tzloch had figured, I'm going to chop trees, but I'm doing it for a reason other than that I want the wood. And therefore, it's part of, this is not as serious a melacha. And to do an Avera in order to save other people from doing more serious Avera, that is something we allow. There's a, we pass in that way in Shukon Oruch, that there are situations where you're allowed to break Shabbos even if you're going to stop other people from breaking Shabbos their whole lives. You can break one Shabbos in, in certain circumstances if that's going to be the result of somebody else keeping Shabbos all their lives. And that was Tzofka's calculation. Asks Rebbe Chonon Vassaman, but surely, so then the Mashal goes on to say, so why was he given the death sentence then? So Melok Hashem why was he given the death sentence? Answers the Mashal, because Basin didn't know. They've got to go by what they saw. They saw a man chopping wood. They ate him, warned him, he carried on chopping the wood, you've got to give him the death sentence. You can't start figuring out what his intention was. Asks the, the Rebuchon of Vassaman, but Moshe goes to Hashem. Hashem knows his intention. And Hashem says, put him to death. If it's a Melok Hashem, it's Rechel but doesn't Hashem know the Alosha as well? And uh, the Rebbe the, the doesn't really deal with the answer, but clearly what we've got to say is that Stolkhan had to do it in a way where he did use the wood. He had to do the, the, the Isra in a way that he would be put to death. So he, he had to, so to say, fool the Edim almost, so that they wouldn't see there would be no indication in his action as to what his intention was. The action was a clear Hilul Shabbat, the action was a clear profaning of the Shabbat, Aid him, the witnesses see it, they warn him, he continues, the death sentence is applied. The fact that in his mind he did it for the purposes of the Shem Shemayim need cover, it means when he comes to Shemayim, he'll have Ganadian. He's not going to be punished. His soul doesn't get punished. Just his body gets punished because physically he did something that was wrong and he must have done it in that way. But we, we see from here how difficult it is to convey seriousness just through a textbook or through a lesson or through information and facts. Uh, everybody knows you know, the famous example. Everybody knew for many, for many, many decades, if not more, that smoking was incredibly harmful to health. That didn't stop people from 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 smoking, and the Surgeon General's warning didn't stop people from smoking, and the additional taxes they put on cigarettes didn't stop people from smoking. What stopped people from smoking eventually was when people understood the linkage between the terrible suffering of lung cancer, God forbid, and the smoking of cigarettes. Then they understood this is something serious. You can't mess around with this. People need to need to visually see the consequence of an action in order to understand seriousness. You've got to be able to teach experientially. You've got to be able to teach emotionally for that to be the case. And that's why you'll find that the, the Mishnah Brewer is, is a Sefer of Halacha that's written in a very unusual way. It's a very lengthy way. The, the Mishnah Bruder wants to give you more than the bottom line of the Halacha, the way the Chaya Adam does, for example. The Mishnah Bruder wants to take you into the whole area of the ins and outs of Halacha and why things are important and where exactly they fit and what is the contents, to, uh, the contents of it so that you build a relationship with Halacha. It's not just about knowing the halakha, but that one builds a relationship with halakha. And Slofchad wanted to be sure that even in Kutzlar, it's before they came to Israel and never, never have any chance of going to Israel in the future, they understood the seriousness of Shmirat Shabbat, of keeping Shabbat, and that they felt it to the depth of their soul and would treat it with the seriousness that the halakha requires them to do.